Welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my co-host, partner in crime, the doctor, uh, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. Hey, now. We got Benny uh, produce, producing us behind the glass. And uh, today we're going to do uh, uh, a retrospective episode. We're going to talk about the uh, the 50-year anniversary of the uh, Major Coxon murder, which was a really big deal. Uh on the East Coast of the United States back in the early 70s, Major Coxon was a very colorful, flamboyant power broker, kind of uh, both in the underworld and in legitimate society, was best friends with Muhammad Ali, had a lot of dealings with both the Italian mafia in New York and the uh, Italian mafia in Philadelphia, as well as the kind of gonna, it's going to be our point of departure in this episode, the Philadelphia Black Mafia or the um, PBM. So uh, we're going to do a little deep dive on that. I want to remind everybody to like, subscribe, share uh, on the socials. We're trying to grow this thing every day. We're trying to give you more content and uh, it only helps when we can, you know, amplify the word. So uh, this month is the uh, 50 anniversary of the, of the major Coxon I don't want to say it's a massacre, but it almost was. It's two two they people. Tried. They tried. Uh, the Philly Black Mafia family, who had been very closely aligned with Major Coxon, worked together for uh, you know five ten years, made a lot of money together, uh, but it didn't seem to matter. In the summer of 1973, uh, he had just run for mayor of Camden, New Jersey, so he was like a political figure. When when he was murdered uh, and Muhammad Ali, who was his best friend at that time and lived down the street from him and had actually bought his house. And and then Major Coxon built this like postmodern futuristic mansion, like out of a Star Trek episode, which is where he was. It's a mur- pretty cool mod. Yeah. In, house. in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which, which is where he was murdered. And we're going to get into the reasons why. But uh, Muhammad Ali in the in the two years leading up to Coxon's uh, slain, Muhammad Ali propelled this guy into the national conversation because Muhammad Ali at that point was the probably the most recognizable athlete on the planet. And for about 18 months, whenever you put a microphone in his face, he was propping up Major Coxon, Mm -hmm. like literally on national television, uh, on, on numerous appearances. And I think the most famous was when he, he, uh, fought Jerry Quarry in one of his comeback fights after he had to leave the, um, leave the ring because of his political uh, um, protests. And he grabbed the mic from Howard Cosell and said, I want to dedicate this win and this fight to the future mayor of Camden, New Jersey, Major Coxon. So um, I'm going to throw it over to Jimmy, and I think we're going to just kind of give some context to the situation that, that came to a head and erupted in a very violent manner in the first week of June, 1973. But let's talk a little bit about the organization of the the Philly Black Mafia family and how they dealt with the Italians, how they dealt with people like Coxon who who were their entry points into um, higher society, I guess. Yeah, uh, this is one of my favorite case studies to research and shout out to Sean Patrick Griffin, who's a friend of the show, Black Brothers Inc. One of the greatest true crime books ever written. I agree. Yeah, it's in the Hall of Fame. It's it's one of my favorites, and uh, this is you know primarily where where I, I did my research, just looking at his text. Um, but another thing I want to point out is something interesting about this area is if you're if you're not from that area, um, I, I I've spent a lot of time there because of family. I, I didn't grow up there or anything, but um, if you're unfamiliar with that. Area Philly, Camden, and Cherry Hill are literally right next to each yeah. other. So within you, what five, seven miles, something like right. that. I mean, it's really Camden and Philly literally, yeah, but up you're, against each other. You're, and Cherry Hill's right there too. So you're living in New Jersey, but you're a, a suburbanite from the Philadelphia yeah, area, right? And so Camden and Cherry Hill, Philly's like their main hub. Yeah, and then a little bit farther. Toward the coast is uh, around the coast is Atlantic City, yeah. so that's why this area has always been so fascinating to me. Whether it's the the Bruno Scarfo family, the Philly Black Mafia, the Cherry Hill Gambinos, the Atlantic City stuff, 
there's a this is a hotbed of underworld activity in a small yeah uh, geo, uh geographic uh space and if so you're not if you're not from there and you've never been there i mean i remember one of the first times i went to philly i stayed in cherry hill yeah and i was like wait cherry hill new jersey i thought this was like you know we were uh an hour, two hours from Philadelphia, no, and you're right. literally That's, five minutes yeah. from South Philly. It's right, depending on traffic. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, the Black Mafia is a fascinating case study, and um, it, it's interesting because we 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 know now from some of this research from guys like Griffin and some of the reporting coming out of the '70s that this was not just some loose network of African American criminals who kind of knew each other and worked with each other from time to time. This really was uh, a black mafia. Uh, it was an highly organization. Structure, highly structured, high, right, borderline paramilitary. Yes, right, right. They had a d- divisions of labor. They were in all sorts of different rackets, um, everything from uh, armed robbery. It actually, one of the, when they first were getting going, a lot of it was just what, what you would think of with, with, this is usually the case with these kind of groups, extortion. Start shaking hits, people down. Hits for hire. Right, right. Muscle, muscle just hire. muscle work. Right. So, uh, but eventually they get into large scale drug trafficking, armed robbery, uh, uh, arms trafficking, hijacking, uh, gambling. A lot of the, they were big time uh, a gambling, uh, gambling dens. Right. In that, um, and then they, North Philly and, and then I think these guys, and then there were some guys in, in Chicago. And I, I don't know the exact timeline who was first, but, they, and I guess there was some of this going on, I think, uh, in, in California as well, but it was more, there was more political Black Panther connections to it. Yeah. But where they found a way to get government funding right. and kind of a government shield to pretend that they were doing community work and have this community work funded by grants and whatnot, yeah. when in reality it was just a, um, uh, you know, a, a facade for their criminal activity. And yeah. that's where black, that's kind of where the term black brothers Inc comes from. Right. Not that, kind of, that's where it comes that, from. That's where it comes from. Right. So there was a parallel. This was going on in Chicago for sure. Um, and this was, these were programs that were coming out of the great society, uh, LBJ, in the 1960s community empowerment grants. And, you know, to be fair, some of those community empowerment grants did go to organizations that were legit and and they tried to help education and minority owned businesses and things like that. But there's no question that in some cases, some shady dudes were, were using that opportunity to launder money. And, and basically, as you point out, just to have a um, to legitimize what was ostensibly a criminal. Organization. And I think for the Philadelphia guys it extended their maybe not the the founders themselves but the organization i think it extended their lifespan i think so but but the that original generation well i, I don't want to get into it just yet but it, it would have but they were so conspicuously violent <laughs> that eventually they went down but if they had been if they had been less yeah. i think uh rogue uh it, it probably could have but it could have lasted you pointed out and, and again i want i want to contextualize this as much as possible because there is nuance before we got on air and we, we should, you know, uh, color this up for people, there were really kind of three separate generations of, of Philly black mafia f- uh, group. And, and, and part of it, remnants of it exist today. Yeah. Uh, but it, the people that started it and the people that were leading it later on were, were different, which yeah. is also another reason why it was more organized, more of like a, organization right so the 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 first regime uh first layer or first regime uh that they were the ones that were most connected to the nation of islam right so that that's a place sam christian and ron harvey who right and christian would be they didn't use these terms but we would say like the the boss right harvey would have been the underboss if if yeah you know if they used those kind of uh that's basically what their ranking and, and these guys were just brute force yeah, they were pretty mean guys. I had there was uh, no, rap there sheets a mile long. There was no finesse no, in, no. in Christian and Harvey. No. They were, um, you respect power, and yeah. that was their approach. And we're going to be, we're going to blast through the door. We're going to blast the doors off the hinges yeah. with the power that we're going to bring right off the bat, establishing ourselves as a, as a, you know, a force to be reckoned with in the underworld. Yeah, and when you talk about no finesse, I mean, I, I, I know I draw these, comparisons from, from Hollywood, but they just, they're the ones that pop in my head and people 
or maybe you're more familiar with. But you think of the scene in American Gangster where he shoots um, Tango. Denzel shoot right shoots him right there in front of everyone. But but which was that's not what Frank Lucas did. <laughs> yeah, but that never happened. But with these guys, that that that's like almost the kind of shit that they would do because yeah. they would do that radical shit in broad daylight. To your point about they wanted to be conspicuous. That was the whole point. Yeah, was take note of who's in charge here. And I think we're Make gonna no mistake. You know, you'll see it exemplified in the Major Coxon murder, where these people are, are so bloodthirsty that they don't want to just take out their aggression on the person that they're mad at, which is Major Coxon, but they try to kill his whole family. So right. it's like it's just uh, unadulterated evil with a lot of this. There's no, <laughs> not uh, you know, sit there and get moral and ethical judgments on criminal activity, but I can always find a level of respect for, for an entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, and, you know, my relatives, Jimmy's relatives, you know, came over from, came over from, right. Came over from Europe, uh, you know, in the early 20th century and nothing was given to them and they had to go take it. Uh, so being entrepreneurial and being a criminal, I'm not saying it's right. But I can understand the mindset more. But sure. just the pure evil uh, and, and viciousness, the visceral viciousness of a group like this is, uh, I think it's a different, uh, a, a just a well, this, different story altogether. Yeah, it reminds me of the, the episode we did with Leo Silva about the, the cartels, yeah. because these guys were, te- that first wave, I should say, were terroristic. Like th- those, those... S- techniques or tactics were designed to terrorize the community and the underworld and it worked like i mean people were really afraid of these guys everybody took notice and they and and it made it where the people that they wanted you know they didn't just want the civilians or the marks to take notice they wanted angelo bruno to take notice yes they they wanted carlo gambino new york to take notice right uh so I think that's an, another uh, layer to this, that they were announcing their presence with authority and, and their, uh, their profile and their reach you know, went from zero to 100 very quickly from, let's say, in the mid-60s where these guys weren't, weren't even really formed yet, uh, at least in the form that we knew them as, but by the mid-70s, they were dominant. Another interesting aspect, I, I want to get back to the Nation of Islam stuff in a moment, but another interesting factor here is the, the element of racism here, which is one of the reasons why they have this, uh, what's the word, uh, meteoric rise is law enforcement and the Italians weren't taking them seriously at first mm-hmm. because they were like, you know, this is race, racist yeah. segregationist society. Right. They're like, black mafia, get the right. fuck out right. of here. Right. Like they don't, they can't organize And then you, yeah, you leave a couple dozen bodies in your wake and right. these guys right. You know, right. perk up, their ears perk up real quick. Yeah, yeah. And then they- And you show them you can make money. <laughs> yeah. Then they got, they eventually got everyone's attention. But so I want to mention this because this is an interesting aspect of the story here. Um, it's the Muhammad Temple 12 is the Nation of Islam um, uh, mosque the there in Philly. In Philadelphia. Right, that, that brings these guys into the fold. And so um, is, uh, Jeremiah Shabazz was the, was the head of the, the sect there, and he was appointed by the Honorable Elijah, Elijah Muhammad. Muhammad. And he brings in guys like Harvey and Christian as enforcers. Into the nation. Into the nation. So that kind of legitimized them and um and protected them the mosque was protection for them yeah and it also it's similar to what we talk about with the italians and other groups when you when you infiltrate legitimate society this can also insulate you in terms of people in the neighborhood or people that were affiliated with the mosque they know these guys are shady right they're not they're not naive but they mix in with their criminal exploits some things for the community <laughs> And so then it, it gets and, like, religion, and you add a religion, and you add a religious to it. component. It's like, to well, it. they're they may be bastards, but they're our they're our bastards, yeah. and so we're not going to snitch on them or talk about them. So even leave the fear part out of it for just just this this kind of psychology of these are our this is our community. And we're not going to snitch on them. Um, and there is this 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 um, argument that Jeremiah Shabazz was the real leader of godfather of the black of the black mafia. Now I don't believe that was ever 
he was ever convicted on any charges like that. Um, usually the, the standard approach is that Sam Christian was the first boss. But there's no question that he deferred to Shabazz on a lot of things, and he worked for him. And I suspect Shabazz was getting a cut of well, I mean, the, the illicit activities they were involved in. I don't with. think this is a newsflash, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole here, but and I can't speak to the Nation of Islam in the 2020s, but the Nation of Islam at that point in time, it, it was more than just the fact that these Philly guys were using them as, uh, you know, cover. I mean, I would say Elijah Muhammad in some ways was a crime boss as well as being the leader a lot, a lot of, of a, people thought that. Right. So just, you know, uh, Malcolm X thought, right. thought that. <laughs> so, and, and just go, you know, bring us, you can hit the siren, Benny, when I try to, we try to bring everything back to Detroit. But I mean, Elijah Muhammad took power in the Nation of Islam in Detroit. Yeah. But again, never proven in court, but a lot of people believe causing the disappearance of the founder of the Nation of Islam who founded it in Detroit. Right. And this guy disappeared in the 1930s. Yeah. Uh, f- uh, f- far, far hot. I don't want to. I can't remember. Yeah. I can't remember. And uh, and Elijah Muhammad uh, ended up taking control of the nation and, and and led it for forty years. And 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 yeah, this is not the rabbit hole to go down, but right. this was part of Malcolm's uh, disenchantment right. with with Elijah Muhammad was the when he became more aware of the hypocrisy and the shady dealings, and he broke off with him, and probably paid for it with his life. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's, I think, I think it's undisputed that conspiracy the conspiracy there. I think Uncle Sam was involved too. Oh, yeah, I, me too. But <laughs> I agree was, with that part of it too. But it's undisputed that the shooters were yeah. were, were Islam, were nation of Islam. Yeah, right, right. I, I think, I think there was some cahoots going on. We yeah. Back to your phrasing, the uh, enemy of my enemy, enemy is, is, is my, my friend, friend and yeah. the nation of Islam and Uncle Sam may be in cahoots there. But that that's a whole nother and to, thing. And to seg it in to the kind of point of departure of this episode with Major Coxon, that's how Muhammad Ali became tied in to Coxon. So Muhammad Ali, I mean, again, everybody probably knows this, was Cassius Clay, uh, comes from Louisville, Kentucky, becomes the champion of the world, within days of becoming champion of the world, announces that he's uh, Muslim. going to change his name to Muhammad Ali. Uh, so he was living in Chicago. He has all of his, you know, political angst, refusing to go into the draft, loses the belt, can't fight, almost goes broke. Da-da. But when he's making his comeback, he leaves Chicago. And where does he go? Philadelphia, Cherry Hill. And who does he hook up with? Major Coxon. So Major Coxon is the person that, and if you read some of Ali's biographies, that's why he moved to that area was because of Coxon, not just because of the mosque there and and the the nation there, because the nation was in Chicago too. Right. Yeah, that was the club. Co- yeah, Coxon convinced convinced him to move uh, and train in Pennsylvania and and uh, uh, move down to the Philadelphia area. And they began spending a lot of time together. I believe they met each other in 1967 or 68. Um, and by the early 70s, Ali has moved to Cherry Hill and is living down the street from Coxon. And they're spending inordinate amounts of time together. And at this point, Coxon is rebranding himself a politician and I think to his credit, I want to throw this to Jimmy, you know, from a from the socioacademic perspective. I thought he, I, I think Coxon was very smart in addressing the elephant in the room when he announced that he was trying to be a politician. And he had this uh, go to quip where he would say, you know, most politicians start clean and end up dirty. <laughs> right, right. He's right. like, I'm flipping it. Yeah. I'm flipping the paradigm. I was dirty. And now from knowing the wrongs of, of yeah. my previous ways, now I'm clean it up. I know how to clean it up. And, and now I'm going to, I'm going to go from dirty to clean as opposed from clean to dirty. Yeah. Which was, which is pretty smart. I mean, ultimately he didn't win the election, but it's smart in the yeah. sense of just getting in front of it. Like, yeah. just like, let me just tackle this right now <laughs> rather than like these allegations and like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. I was a crook and, <laughs> and he, and he's another one of these guys that, Although he had his fingers in a lot of pies in terms of um, 
business interests. A lot of them weren't in his name. Right. And this guy lived a life and, and uh, promoted a style of living that couldn't necessarily be backed up with tax returns. Like he yeah. lived high on the hog. He had a limit. He had a chauffeur. He drove around in a stretch limousine in multiple homes. Yeah. Uh, right. He was a jet setter uh, dressed in the finest clothes. Yeah. Dated the finest women, drove the finest cars, so forth and so forth. Um, and didn't really, it was hard to trace the money. Right. And he, he was an interesting guy because he's really at this sort of nexus of, he is connected to legitimate society, like not only legitimate business people, but celebrities like Ali. He's connected to the, to the Temple 12, which, which means black mafia. Yeah. But he's, he's conne- also connected to the Italians, not just in Philly, but in New York. Well, Carlo Gambino's crime family right. specific. I mean, uh, Carlo wasn't that, rem- that far removed from the people that were dealing with Major Cox. And, you know, uh, one name that's come up quite a bit in that um, investigation into those ties was Carmine Lombardozzi. Sorry. Yeah. Carmine Lombardozzi. They called him the doc mm-hmm. or doctor. And he was Carlo Gambino's main drug skipper. Yeah, and this is a little bit before the Cherry Hill Gambinos yeah. ramp up there. They were they were around, right? But this was before they were the the primary drug suppliers in the Gambino family. Uh, but there were other guys that were that were dealing junk uh, before that, and and he was one of those guys. I'm, when I pointed uh, my point to the uh, audience, the listeners, the viewers, is that it wasn't like Major Coxon was doing business with the Gambinos, and he was doing business with like. Out of a, a a roster of five hundred guys, yeah. he's doing business with the four ninety nine, four ninety nine, or an associate of an associate of number four ninety nine. Right, right, like no, he was doing business with the, the top echelon yeah. guys in both the Philadelphia mafia, the Bruno crime family at that point, yeah. and and the Gambinos. Yeah, so he is uh, he's brokering uh, deals. So he is the he's the guy who is able to um, get the black mafia to buy heroin from the Italians. Um, he's also one of these guys who is like a fixer. Sometimes if the Bruno family needed muscle or something like that, he's, you know, they go to him. He can, he can get black brotherhood guys or black mafia guys. So he's, he's really an important uh, pivotal figure in the underworld in this whole, in this whole um, tri-state area. And um, I mean, just before we get to the, to the sensationalistic murder of him, Let's talk about maybe one of the other high profile crimes the Black Mafia commits around this time, which is the furniture store yeah, so there was a heist se- and robbery. There was a series of very brazen yeah. crimes, murders, shootings that like got increasingly worse, increasingly um I just keep on going back to vicious because this yeah. So you, you had it's more intense. You had the the Dubro furniture situation. You had the uh the the, the club uh oh, right, yeah. murders in in Atlantic, in Atlantic City and you had the the Major Cox and uh slain. And yes. they all happened in the same year, two years. Right. So the let's start with the uh um with the, the furniture store, because then the, the Atlantic City one's more closer yeah. related to the Cox one. But the furniture store uh, I think I, I don't know if it's Dubro or Dubrow's um, furniture store, which was uh, what, what would you say, like a, just an institution yeah, in that in, area, in that area, yeah, uh, in downtown Philadelphia, or what, was it um, South? I can't remember exactly what part of Philly it, it was located. Yeah, but, um, but it was but a it was, well it was known inst- location. It was, uh, yeah, it was a landmark. Yeah, landmark uh, place, institution, and they robbed the place and tried to extort it. In broad daylight, not right. like, um, you know, uh, uh, hey, uh, you know, it would be a shame if something bad were to happen to you. <laughs> yeah, and everybody goes home, they close <laughs> right. up the shop, and they at 3 o'clock in the morning, a firebomb. Or firebomb, right. right. I mean, they walked in broad daylight and said, you know, you this is we control this territory now. you got to pay us a, a, an extortion tax. And, uh, you know, they were like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. So they said, well, let, let us explain right. what we're talking about. So they tie everyone up, customers, empl- uh, employees, uh, they tie everyone up 
uh, start, you know, pistol whipping people. Uh, one guy was killed. I think the it was either a security guard or mm-hmm. one of the employees was killed. Maybe it was a janitor. I can't remember. But um, and then they say, if you don't believe us yet, they start dousing the place, place with, with gasoline. With accelerant. Yeah. <laughs> right? Or whatever, some kind of flammable. And they're like, we're going to torch this fucking place with all of you tied up in it. Uh, if you don't understand that. that and know, the, per- and the person that was leading this team of uh, robbers, killers, <laughs> ruffians was one of the original founding members. And, and he plays a role in future generations. Uh, of of the organization his name is robert mims he went by the nickname nudie and nudie was the one that was leading the charge in this uh this this just like insane unreal extortion effort yeah and this is one of those examples of it was so high profile if the media and law enforcement weren't taking them seriously yet yeah. they they were now which not only was bad for them in terms of the the so-called black mafia, but this, of course, then brought heat on the nation of Islam too, right? It all started to you know, become exposed. But that was one of the, the more high-profile public uh, examples of their criminality. The second one was the, the um, execution, assassination of a guy who was a similar kind of player to Major Coxon, maybe not quite as big, but... He was, no, I would say that Ty, his name was Tyrone Palmer. Yeah, Mr. He, Millionaire. They he him. was more of a gangster version of Coxon. Yeah. Coxon was more of a racketeer. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with that. He was a major uh, drug dealer in the, um, working with the Italians. Right. Um, directly with the Bruno family, Ty Palmer. And, um, he was also working with the black mafia and I can't remember exactly what went bad, but something, I, I don't know if Palmer stiffed them on a drug deal or something. Do you remember the, I, I can't remember what went bad. It, it was some dispute over a drug. I'm sure that's what a it drug was. dealer, drug territory. Yeah. Or who was paying who, what, or who was answering to who and what deal. Yeah. So back to your point about how they would shoot first and ask questions. So there was no, like, let's have a sit down. And it was just like, we're going to kill this mother. And they went into a club, <laughs> which was like the, the, the most popular club for, for the African American community in Atlantic City, yeah, Club Harlem. It was like a weekend. The place was packed. Yeah, and, and they go use it for shooting practice. Yeah, and there was a, a, a prominent uh, R and B artist performing that evening. I think I think it was Billy Paul. If I'm yeah, not it mistaken. was Billy Paul. And then and then not only is Ty Palmer killed, but his bodyguard, uh, Big Malik Satterwhite, who was a large individual that watched Tyrone's back. Tyrone was a big guy too. Yeah. That they both were killed in the So it was so conspicuous. I mean they they start shooting in the middle of the performance. The band, everyone hits the deck hiding behind drum set and and shit like that. It was very conspicuous. And, so and it should be pointed out that these are these OG PBM guys, the guys that founded the group and really set the tone. Sam Christian, Ron Harvey, Nudie Mims, the first three that we mentioned, they weren't sending underlings to no, do their dirty great, great work. Point. They were great doing point. the dirty work themselves and relishing it. Great point. Yeah. No, that's the, that's a great point. I had, had Sam Christian and I believe Ron Harvey went into Club yeah. Harlem and personally took care of Tyrone Palmer and Malik Sadoy. Yeah, and happy to do so. Yeah. It's not like, well, we couldn't find anyone else. Right. They, they and allegedly enjoyed their work with Major Coxon. It was Sam Christian and Ron Harvey, who were the bosses of the organization, going to deal with the problem firsthand. Yeah. So Coxon would have been well aware of how serious these guys were at this point. So, yeah. so now why don't you set up the specific scenario where he gets in trouble? So Coxon is spending all of 72 into 73 running for mayor of Camden. What's it, just it's interesting for fans of pop culture and film, the movie American Hustle, where there's a character played by Jeremy Renner, mm-hmm. who I think the character's name was Carmine Polito. That wasn't his real name, but it was an Italian. Um, it was an Italian politician that Coxon was running against. That politician beat Coxon, and then got caught up a decade later in Abscam, which was shown in the movie yeah. uh, American Hustle. So, uh, at the same time of the election, I believe the election was March. 8th, March 7th or 8th of 73 is the night of the election. Coxon loses. I believe a couple days before the election, it might have been March 2nd or 3rd, 
there is a million dollar shipment of heroin traveling from Brooklyn to Philadelphia. Um, at this point, Major Coxon has nothing to do with the deal. It's a deal that's being made between Bo Baines of the Philly Black Mafia family, who's the, the second the leader, kind of the second generation, right, kind right. of a less, less violent, right. more diplomatic. Yeah. Um, he's on one side of the deal. And then the Gambino crime family and the Lombardozzi crew They're the suppliers. are on the other side of it. Yeah. And two guys that were unaffiliated, that were just kind of stick up kids, if you know the wire and you know that expression. Yeah. yeah. Uh, got wind of the package. Either they didn't know who this deal was involving or they were too strung out to, to care. care. They robbed the shipment and a million dollars of drugs are in the wind. Coxon loses on March 8th, loses the election. And at some point by the end of March, the Gambinos in New York call Coxon to Brooklyn and ask him if he could troubleshoot for them. And they say, we got $300,000 for you if you find out who these two guys are, bring them to us, and get us our drugs back. Coxon goes back to Cherry Hill, Philadelphia area and subcontracts to his friends in the Philly Black Mafia family and promises them 200000 to do the job that the Gambinos were asking him to do. Uh, in I think they spend a, a, a month of due diligence trying to find who did it and where they were. And then on like May 1st, I think these two guys, these two stick up kids end up dead in an alley. The Philly black mafia guys, I don't know who specifically did this, but people that were working on Bo Baines's behalf just took the drugs themselves didn't give the drugs to Major Coxon to give back to the Gambinos. The Gambino said, not only did we want our drugs back, but we wanted to deal with these two guys. Right. We just wanted you to find them for us. Right. The Gambinos are telling Major Coxon, you, I guess, broke your part of the contract or didn't fulfill your end of the contract. So we're not going to give you anything. The Philly Black Mafia family guys who did the 200 K uh, worth of muscle work. They didn't care. Right. That, that, that their pavement in theory would have been the drugs. Uh, they wanted the 200 K that, that major Coxon had promised them. Yeah. Major Coxon, as I, as I was talking about earlier, he, he lived very, a very flashy existence. I don't know how much was liquid. Right, I don't think he had 200 k right, on have, hand right. <laughs> to just buy his way out of this. So he was scrambling for a good month to try to raise the money. And it was, you know, you know, he was kind of viewed as a dead man walking. Nobody wanted to give him the money. And then the first week of June, I think it was June 3rd, first week of June, uh, 1973, according to the, uh, according to investigators, According to the FBI, uh, Harvey and Christian forced their way into the house or got into the house because Major Coxon let them in the house. Now, they were, the charges never stuck. They were convicted on other things. Yeah. But the actual charges in related to Coxon were never adjudicated with Christian and Harvey. Yeah. Maybe Harvey, but I, I'm, I agree with you. Christian think, for sure was not. Okay. He was indicted. He was uh, convicted of other charges. Right. But, they were both indicted for this. Right. But Harvey, I can't remember. You may be right, but I can't remember if it, for some reason, I'm thinking one of them was convicted of it, but I, I can't remember. But Major Coxon lives in this postmodern futuristic mansion. Yeah. It's pretty cool looking. And uh, Harvey and Christian and whoever else allegedly come in there and they don't, just take care of Major Coxon. Major Coxon has a, 
a, a girlfriend who's more of like a common law wife. He had been with her for 15 years or so and had, you know, claimed her, her kids as his kids. And, uh, I think there were, there was him, her, and it, I think at, at least, least three, yeah, at least, at least three, three kids or whatever you call it. Yeah. And, um, they, they tied them all up, uh, gagged them, blindfolded them and shoot them all and try to shoot them all in the head. The one of the little boys was able to escape. Yeah. I think uh, through the bathroom window or something like that. Coxon is killed at point blank range. One of his stepdaughters is killed. Mm-hmm. Another one of his stepdaughters survives being shot. And the common law wife survives, but is paralyzed for the rest of her life. Yeah. And the only reason why they survived was the one boy got away and was able to yeah. like call 911 right. or whatever, notify somebody that right. called the police or else they would have, they would have bled out too. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it's another example it's of brutal, how so brutal uh, vicious they were because again, um, they could have Coxon was not hiding. He was very high right. profile. They could have hit him. He was a man about town until the very end. Yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't ducking anybody. They could have hit him anywhere. They chose to go to his house where his family, the civilians would be. And, 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 and even still, you don't have to execute the family. It was bloodlust. I mean, it's, uh, it was, again, was part of this, like, we're sending this message that we're fucking crazy. And I think it's also noteworthy. I don't know why I'm smiling. It's not funny, but what was Muhammad Ali's reaction? So immediately all of the media outlets, because Muhammad Ali had been running around, not just Jersey and Philadelphia, he'd been running around the country for the previous year, year and a half, shouting the praises of Major Cox. And he wasn't being shy about his friendship no. or his relationship. But the second that Coxon's murdered, all of a sudden, you know, I met him a couple times. Yeah, hardly knew. Him. I hardly barely knew, knew the guy. <laughs> right, is what right. what Muhammad Ali was saying. Yeah, and, it, and it's just it's clear hypocrisy. Yeah, because you know you were you were literally not just flying around the country shouting his praises, but you literally jumped on national television at a time when there were only three networks, and it grabbed the microphone from Howard Cosell and told everyone what a huge how much you loved Major Coxon, and then. Less than a year later, you're going to do a, I didn't know the guy. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. I'm not an expert on Ali at all. I've never read a biography or anything, but I, I, I can imagine that Ali knew that Coxon was a, was a sketchy dude, but I imagine Ali did not appreciate the, the, the type gravity. of people that Coxon was dealing with. Yeah. Like when that goes bad the types of consequences that that can result. I, I, I suspect he never fully appreciated that. I, I don't know if this you know, people can, can fact check us on that. If they've read biographies of him or you know, I don't know. Sean Patrick Griffin put out a great uh, thread on social media on the anniversary date a couple weeks ago. I'm not positive if I got these photos from his thread or from another thread, but someone was talking about this on social media during the anniversary. And they said, don't let people tell you, that Muhammad Ali was just connected to Major Coxon. Here are some photos of Muhammad Ali with Nudie Mims. Here are some photos I'm of sure. Muhammad Ali with Bo Baines. Yeah, I'm sure. So well, they were it was all the same circle. Right. So it, it would that would make that would make sense. So let's talk about Baines and, and Mims. And, and Ali oh, might have been sorry, but Ali was actually my understanding is Ali was in fear himself. Yes. At that, when, when you first went down. Yeah. Be, because he was so closely affiliated. And think about him. how close, I know I'm, I'm mixing apples and oranges a little bit, but I think it speaks to the time. Think about how close that was to the Manson murders. Yeah. Even though it was across country and it was a different circumstance. But it was a massacre of people close yeah. to celebrities yeah. or celebrities themselves where the killers really didn't care I'm sure Muhammad Ali's thinking, these guys went and tried to kill Major Cox and his whole family. They don't care that I'm Muhammad Ali. No. They'll kill me too. Of course. And they they would have if they yeah. had if they had good good reason to, or in yeah. their minds good reason yeah. to. Well that let so then let's talk about the the speaking of celebrities, let's talk about celebrity athletes. The last high profile crime of that first wave of leadership, because then there's still more black mafia to talk about. But this involves Another guy who converts to Islam, Lou Cinder, who becomes Kareem right. Abdul-Jabbar. Yes. So let's, you want to 
well, flesh that out a bit. I think I think that, that's even worse. Right. If you thought that co- what we just talked yeah. about was wor- was bad, this is even worse. And, and there's a dovetailing here, um, not a direct connection in terms of Coxon, but a direct a direct connection in terms of these Philly Black Mafia figures we're talking about, Harvey and Christian, um, Ron Ron Harvey and Sam Christian. So just like with my, uh, with Malcolm X, who was a disciple of Elijah Muhammad. And then tried to break off and create his own sect of Muslim, and then eventually was assassinated. Uh, there was another disciple of Elijah Muhammad who, in the late seventies, or sorry, early seventies, broke off and t- to start his own sect of of uh, the nation, and got financial backing from Kareem Abdul Jabbar, formerly Lou Alcindor. Um, who just like Muhammad Ali was one of the most recognizable athletes, not just in America, but on the planet at that point. And Jabbar felt so close that they were, they were known as the the Hanafi Muslims. I think so. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name, Uh, but he felt so close to them that he, Hanafi, yeah. He either moved out of his mansion in DC and gave them his mansion or he, or he purchased them a mansion, an estate and like a compound yeah, to, um, to, to run their affairs out of. Now at this point, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is playing for the Milwaukee bucks and is living in Milwaukee. Most of the, most of the year. Did you know that by the way, Benny? That he used to play for the Bucks before the Lakers. He won his first title. Won, <laughs> won his first title with the yeah, Bucks. Yeah, Milwaukee. Because when I was a kid, he, won. he yeah, was he Oscar was already Rob- with the Lakers. Right, me. I don't have. I, I have no memory of him with anyone but the Lakers. <laughs> no, right, Oscar right. Robert. Him and Oscar yeah, Roberts. Yeah. Or was it Oscar or Earl Monroe? Oscar, but I think Earl was Earl Monroe on that team. I don't know. Okay, nonetheless, Earl. nonetheless, yeah. um, the Philly Black Mafia was contracted allegedly by the nation of Islam's leaders to, 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 to hit basically to put out a hit on the Hanafi branch that this Hanafi guy started. And just like with major Coxon, they storm the mansion. They tie everybody up. There are like infants that they drown in a bathtub uh, I think, and the I think they killed was, was like nine months. They old. killed like seven people in this. By the way, the main target wasn't even there, right? And, and they still Hana- killed everyone, the, right? In there. The Hanafi guy that they went to go kill, right, wasn't there. He wasn't they even there. They just killed his lieutenants and their families, right? And and um, we should also note a little bit of context here is that this split was not an amicable split, right? So the Hanafi sect. Not only did they just break off because we're incompatible or something, but they were but calling it, him a false prophet. Right, right. They were releasing these like PR things, denouncing him as opposed to Malcolm, he was a gangster. He was a, a sexual yeah. deviant, things like that. So Malcolm wasn't. I think Malcolm was privately blasting the nation. Yeah, but not publicly. No, no his, he was now much he was, more diplomatic. About he was it. doing things such as meeting with Martin Luther King, that were promoting anti nate or. That were kind of against what the nation would do, yeah, which would upset the nation. But yeah. he wasn't like he wasn't going on television or te- or, or, or taking big interviews and calling Elijah Muhammad uh, a, no, a fraud. No, he ca- he kind of kept it to himself. Which whereas is, this other one was right. very public. Right. So you're, you're, I'm glad you pointed it out because that is what got that contract put on. Right, was the fact that he had called him a fa- had called Elijah Muhammad a false prophet. Right, and that was that was um, unacceptable. So. But who do they use? They don't use people from the temple. I mean, I guess they did, but not from Chicago. At least. Right. They use the Philly Black Mafia guys. allegedly. Right. And so Christian and Harvey after this, again, this just shocks that, you know, everyone, if you, they thought the Coxon thing was bad, this is this is even worse. And or at least whatever, however you want to say more severe, whatever. But um, so Christian and Harvey, the number one, number two in the Philly Black Mafia now are on the FBI's. Most wanted list. So, so now um, they're going after these guys. Um, so I'm not sure with the timeline what that. Maybe you're right with the Cox, and maybe they, I can't. I'm I'm now kind of confused about the all timeline, those but. four those four brazen 
slains or uh, double, triple homicides. So, so they may have overlapped. They all that, happened yeah, between I, I like 72 right. and 73 or between there was like, it all was consolidated within like so, 18, right. they 19 They may have months. already been wanted before yeah. the, the Washington. And then now it's a full court national, like yeah. federal law enforcement. Now it is it's a, they're on their radar and there's um you know you can look in the book or online there's some pretty cool FBI most wanted posters posters for for uh Harvey and Christian and uh they eventually get them and and Christian they actually found here in Detroit um and so kind of an interesting uh Detroit angle there but they they get both of them and then Bo Baines uh ascends to the boss he had kind of been their street boss I don't know if it was an official title or not um and we said he he was um he was still ruthless, but less ruthless, I guess. Well, they were uh, a lot more polished. That right. second wave right. of, of leadership. And uh, he got his um, his hooks, I guess you could say, into the, the Philadelphia Black Soul Movement, which was uh, kind of a response to Motown, where there was a lot of great uh, rhythm and blues music mm-hmm. coming out of the Philadelphia area being produced by the same people. Uh, I know Gamble and Huff, I think were the two big names that I think they'd also worked at Motown at one point. Um, excuse me if I'm wrong with that, but they, these, these were like the, the Barry Gordy's mm-hmm. of Philadelphia. And one of the big labels that produced this type of music was called Philly groove records. Mm-hmm. And it was basically owned by the Philly black mafia. Stan Watson, uh, Stan, the man Watson was a, uh, at very least he was an affiliate, if Mm -hmm. not a member. And Bo Baines was running the show. I mean, he he was working there, but it was kind of like one of those things where, you know, Sam Rothstein is, is the head of food and beverage, (laughs) but in reality he's calm. (laughs) So Bo Baines, um, muscled his way into the, into the music industry and, Again, there's there's never been any. Um, Bo Baines died a couple of years ago, and he had kind of turned around his life at the end. Uh, yeah, and, and he, as far as I know, I mean, he was always very like sort of um, had this kind of like this was a conspiracy by the federal government to, uh, you know, undermine the the nation of Islam and these these political efforts at black empowerment. Yeah. And because he would distance himself from like Harvey, he would say like, I don't know what, whatever they were doing that had nothing to do with me. Yeah. I was, I was in it for community so, and empowerment. And, 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 and so one of their last alleged high profile murders though, again, it, it speaks to the, uh, the heinous nature of, of, of the operations that these guys carried out. Uh, so, Within that Philly soul music scene, there became a fight basically over who controls Teddy Pendergrass. And Teddy Pendergrass was one of the main. Teddy P. I mean, remember that, it, the uh, Nutty Professor? Yeah. Murphy? I mean, Teddy, Teddy P. I kind of vaguely remember the end of Teddy Pendergrass's like stardom. Yeah. He was on the radio when I was a little kid. But in the 70s, there was nobody like as a. Uh, a, uh, a solo artist in in the kind of African American R and B world. I mean, Teddy was it. T- Teddy was like a LeBron James. Yeah, big deal. And and women swooned, and he was a superstar. Yeah, and he was from Philadelphia, and uh, there was a, a a I don't know if a power struggle or a, a tug of war over who had control over his business affairs. And Teddy Pendergrass's girlfriend, common law wife, I believe her name, I don't know her whole name, they called her Taz. She was murdered. Uh, I don't know if anybody was ever arrested for it. I believe it happened in 1978. I'm looking to see if there's any. And um, the, 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 the authorities believed that it, it was a hit that was ordered on a woman by... Philly black mafia family because they felt that this woman was uh, refusing to give access to Pendergrass. Um, then Teddy Pendergrass himself would get paralyzed in a, uh, car accident, uh, a couple years after that. 
and, and that that obviously affected his career. But well, and that was that was more high profile, which was in a lot of ways counter to the second wave's leadership style, right. which where they were they actually made efforts to in terms of damage control for PR, and they and they actually were able to get connected. They were more, more business-minded. And they were able to get connected with local politicians, local judges, and kind of use, use get those federal grants. And They got deeper in with the Philadelphia right. Italian mafia, right. with and, Long John Monterano. And part of it was, we're not going to be as conspicuously violent killing kids and shit like that. It's now we, 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 it's not like we won't kill people if we, if we have to, but, but that's not going to be our first order. A of couple of the, here. a couple of Bo Bain's successors were murdered yeah, uh, yeah, in yeah. the late seventies, early eighties. So yeah. it wasn't like they stopped being no, no, violent. Of course not. But to your point, it, it wasn't their calling card the way it was right earlier. We're not going to set the furniture the, store yeah. on fire in front of everybody. The bottom <laughs> line became more important. Right. And, and that's where I think Angelo Bruno was okay with green lighting more joint endeavors. And, and Long John Moderano, who already was, he was all, you know, again, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but Long John Moderano was killed about 20 years ago. Still an open investigation. He was a, you know, a polarizing figure until the day he died. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the polarization with Long John started in the late seventies because he was so close to Angelo Bruno. Uh, and he was allowed to deal drugs when nobody else was. Mm -hmm. And he was not just Angelo Bruno's connection to the bikers, but he was also Angelo Bruno's connection to these Philly black mafia family guys. And it was, I think there was a, um, we talked a little bit about this off air, Long John didn't really, again, from what I've heard and talked to and research, didn't really look down on these black mafia family guys. He saw them as all, you know, kind of equals and wasn't, you know, showed a lot of reverence and respect for these guys. And I think that people judged him for that on the street. Yeah. But I think some of that was jealousy because of his position as one of Angelo Bruno's kind of uh, golden child. Um, and then, you know, again, I'm not going to go into this, but when he got out of prison in the late nineties, you know, he, he worried the Philly mob guys that were in charge then that he was, you know, thinking about breaking off from them and making, uh, you know, building his own thing and, and had always kind of been this, uh, you know, lightning rod. And I think it started with his relationship with the Baines era guys. Well, there was this racial politics in the underworld where. You had some of the Italian guys, the Bruno guys, who viewed the black mafia as just a means to an end. Like, sure, we'll do business with them. We don't respect them. And we don't like you. We we're, don't not like gonna, we're not going to socialize right, with you. Right, we're not going to socialize with you. And so we're still going to be bigoted, but but we, we, we can, we can uh, do business. You see some of this. I'm going back to fake Hollywood examples, but many saints of Newark. <laughs> Kind of captures some of that yeah. that dynamic. Um, so but this is now the late. This is now that many saints of New York. Many saints of Newark was late sixties. Yeah, this is the late seventies, early eighties. Yeah. So uh, there were some guys who I think were condescending to Martirano because he he didn't he didn't have that sort of like kind of uh, he wasn't as uptight about work with African Americans. But there's, there's an interesting dynamic with that second wave where they were able to have more kind of restore copacetic relations with the Italians because with that first wave, they were ultra violent, obviously. And initially they have pretty good relations with the Italians. They're, you know, they're, they're used as extortion guys. Uh, they're dealing drugs with them. But as the first wave black mafia becomes more powerful, they start testing the boundaries of that relationship with the Italians because there were, Italian numbers guys and uh, bookmakers and loan sharks who were operating in black neighborhoods and the black mafia started shaking those, shaking they didn't, those they guys didn't, down. They didn't care that you they were connected. in theory had ties to Scarfo <laughs> right. or, or Testa or Bruno. Yeah. Or. Right. They were like, if this is a black neighborhood, you, you, you pay us. And, and that could have, um, exploded into something but harvey and christian went were taken off the board before that that could you know so with that second wave like bo baines and those guys kind of restored a more 
uh, and certainly the third respectability, wave, you know, um, respectability factor, and 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 also like we're we're like we we can work together. This doesn't have. To I, be, I should uh, I should cav- I should cav- caveat that not, not that they weren't respected before. They were respected because of the fear they uh, caused. Yeah. I think under Baines's leadership and and the and the more polished guys, the, the respect became okay. Now we respect you as businessmen as as well as we respect you as muscle. As yeah. So, um, and th- then those guys were able to not only reestablish stronger ties with the Italians, but also again more mainstream society judges, you know, and politicians. Then by the mid '80s, as as the crack era is is taking off, a bunch of guys that were Aaron boys for nudie Mims in the early '70s when they were in their when they were like in elementary school, junior high school, they like you know got nudie Mims as his, you know, his Cuddy Sark and, and took his, uh, his dry cleaning to the cleaners. Uh, they, with Nudie's backing from prison, Nudie was co-signing them from behind bars. They opened up shop. The third generation kind of rebranded themselves, the JBM, mm-hmm. the Junior Black Mafia, and uh, took over the, the crack game in North Philly and West Philly. Under a guy named Aaron Jones, AJ, who was very close to Nudie, Russell Barnes was another one of these guys that mentored them. And these guys are the ones that are not Aaron Jones specifically, but guys that were his contemporaries are the guys that are still around. It's not a, it's not the same organization it used to be. It's kind of a, a looser, um, less organized group, but they're, they're still a, a a group of these guys that that rep JBM and the current crop of Philly mafia leaders, the guys that came after Scarfo, the Joey Merlinos of the world, get along swimmingly. I mean, get it, Joey Merlino, and it, it, it's not a secret. If you go on social media, you can see a lot of photos of uh, Joey, who's the alleged boss of the Philly group now, out partying with junior black mafia family members and the junior black mafia family members love it for, for the, the leverage they get, the currency they get from taking pictures with Joey Merlino. Well, my understanding is also that they were friendly with Joey even before right. Joey became right, Joey. Joey, so yeah. to speak, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, they were both kind of coming up yep. around the same time. And uh, this is from uh, Sean's book. This is um, regarding uh, Aaron Jones. It was said that JBM leader Aaron Jones was obsessed with the popular film The Godfather and crafted his persona in the mold of Marlon Brando's character Don Vito. So they right they they love the idea of uh, being connected. This goes back to uh, God, it's like I'm going back to all these Hollywood examples, but Carlito's way. Yeah, <laughs> I run with me guys, guys connected guys. Connected guys. So right there was currency. Well, same uh, with Black Mafia family, the modern day Black Mafia family. You know, I've interviewed uh, Big Meech Flannery, and he is open about the fact that, yeah, I, the template for this organization that I built, this historic organization, I read about Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Carlo Gambino, and I use those guys as the blueprint to build what I built. Yeah. You know, uh, Suge Knight was, uh, he loved the movie Bugsy. Yeah. You know, that was one of his, uh, the Godfather too, but Goodfellas, but he loved, he loved Bugsy. Suge Knight bought the, the house that they had in Casino. Oh yeah, right. The the the, the uh, not the Sam Rothstein house. I don't know. I think it was the Sam Rothstein house. Yeah, um, the, the the house that De Niro lived in on the golf course. Yeah, that's right. Suge Knight lived there. That's right. And he bought it because, because of, of <laughs> because of the movie. But there's there was also this very public showing of support of Joey that the Junior Black Mafia during one of Joey's early trials where they showed up in force. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the support and and I believe you know more about Philly than I do. I believe word was sent to them to like yeah maybe not it's not looking so, it doesn't look so great for us. Like, right. so, we appreciate yeah. we appreciate the sentiment, the right, but, right, right. Um, you don't have to necessarily show up in court and you know and I'll, ra- I'll show the flag. We're gonna wrap it up, but I'll just give one you know personal anecdote. And again, Benny hit the hit the siren on this. But uh, when I spent uh, some time with Ralph Natale. Before um, I ended up leaving his his book project because of just you know we couldn't see eye to eye on how to write the book. Uh, he 
told me uh, in, in depth about when he became boss in the fall of 94. Um, he had a, you know, not only did he have to go around and meet all of the Italian mob bosses in on the East Coast, go to New York and break bread with, you know, Andy Mush Russo and, and some other New York bosses to officially kind of confirm his status mm -hmm. as the boss of Bruno Scarfo family. But he went and did the same thing with, at that point, whoever the sitting leadership of, of the junior black mafia was, Ralph told me they had, you know, he had his people go talk to their people. And then they met at a, uh, in the suite of a hotel and uh, that the, the, the JBM guys like brought him presents as, you know, here's the new Don, let me kiss your ring and give you presents. It's interesting. The, the social economics of it, because in, Philly, the neighborhoods still butt up against each other. You have mixed income neighborhoods. You have Italian neighborhoods next to black neighborhoods. That didn't happen in Detroit, which is our, you know, our backyard where uh, as the decades went by, the Italians had less and less contact with, with black. And there was really only they, one. They, didn't, they, they weren't living by each other. They well, in Detroit, you had, it was more disparate. You had kind of one or two mob groups within the Toko Zerilli crime family that dealt with the yeah. African-Americans when all the rest of the group never did. No, Jack Toko would have never. Right. Yeah. He, he barely would sit down with his own, right. with the other Italian guys, let alone right. an African-American dude. Um, but in Philly, things are still, there's a lot more overlap between those communities in, in the underworld than you see like in a place like Detroit where it's very segregated, if that makes sense. And I, yeah. I think at this point, probably Chicago too. I don't know. I don't know if the Italian guys fuck with the black dudes in Chicago that much. Chicago is, you know, I think that's, that's the, um, the city I would say that I think there was the least amount of a nexus point. I think the nexus point existed. Yeah. But I think yeah. out of all the major cities, there was the, uh, the least amount of interactions. Yeah. I know that some of the, you know, the Mickey Cobras, um, yeah. Mickey Cogwell's guys were tied into outfit guys, but yeah. Well, then they, that went bad too with Gene. Yeah. tried to kill yeah, some yeah. of those dudes, but um, well, that was before that. Gene, that's yeah, when yeah. they took over the black rackets right, and right. Um, but uh, in New York and Philly, I can't speak to Boston, but in New York and Philly, I'm just saying the socioeconomics. There's still more interaction and mingling, co-mingling. Oh, and of Boston, the, yeah, the different Boston's ethnic another, crime groups. Boston's another city where there wasn't it, that. It's the most homogenized city I've yeah, ever yeah. been to in my life. Yeah, maybe even more than even Detroit. even now. Uh, you go there, there's only certain parts of the city where you see uh, a uh, diverse yeah. group of people. Yeah. So I, I don't think there has been historically a ton of interactions between the Italian mob guys in Massachusetts and the, 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 the black gangsters. Yeah, but it, ma it makes sense that the, the, the social dynamics and the demographics, then you see in the underworld there was mirror though, that there was though as i'm again i'm digressing here but there was back in the 60s and 70s the chandler brothers um or the campbell brothers and deke chandler who were the big african-american crime lords yeah had, i think we did an episode had a deal that. had like a deal with uh patriarcha and andrew yeah. i think we even that's an yeah. audio only yeah. episode i think um, but yeah, I think the black mafia is, is fascinating. It, you know, there's other stuff we could talk about. Check out again, Sean's book, black brothers, Inc. We're going to try to have Sean on. Uh, he's a friend of the show. Uh, maybe talk about a little bit more about this, but, but actually his other book too, which is a totally different thing. NBA about Tim Donahue, the, the referee, uh, fixing games. And yeah. he's just one of the great, uh, true crime reporters uh you know in america right now and, and we tip our hat to him yeah and he's he's a uh i believe he's a criminologist too i think he's a prof um so check out his book and um we appreciate everyone listening and and watching uh any final thoughts nope. on like nope. share subscribe yeah and thanks for listening thanks for watching we'll see you next time see i'm next jimmy week. bucciolato scott bernstein out